point of history that changed everything. It's just amazing as we look at this. And, you know, every year <clears throat> one of the struggles is, okay, it's Christmas time again. We all know the Christmas story. How am I going to put a fresh spin on this and everything? But you know what? God knows how to take the story. God knows how to take this, this event that we're going to look at today and just hit us fresh again. And I, I pray that as uh, we hear from the Lord, from his word this morning, that we would just be challenged, that we'd be encouraged. Uh, my, my desire for us this morning is that as we look at this, this night when Jesus was born, that we would uh, have a fresh new desire to share the joy and the hope, the love of Christ with our world. Our world is dark. Our world is confused. Our world is without hope. But we know where hope comes from. Yeah? And as those angels were proclaiming to the shepherds that night, we need to proclaim it to the world. We didn't sing that song, go tell it on the mountain, but that's what we need to do. Go tell it on the mountain. Amen. All right. So previously we talked about hope and expectation that the people of old had as they were looking forward to Messiah. I mean, hundreds of years they were looking forward to Messiah. And now as Jesus came, he came in grace as a humble baby. Uh, we also hope in the future return of Jesus as he returns in glory, as I mentioned. Spoken in Revelation, where it shows the great, mighty return of our Lord. I also talked about sharing the message of hope with our world, with family, friends, and community. You know, when I, if I say we need to share hope with the world, you might feel a little overwhelmed. I know I would. But your world, what is your world? We all go to work every day or to school every day. We have family. We have friends. We have neighbors. We have a world that we conduct ourselves in. And it's our privilege to be able to share the hope, the joy with our world, with those in our circle of influence. And so I hope that we're encouraged this morning to do that. <clears throat> Sing that song, Joy to the World. It's not just joy to Christians, not just joy to white people, not just joy to Americans, just... It's joy to the world. Amen? Joy to the world. It's for everyone. There isn't a lot of joy in the world right now, as I said, at least not true, lasting joy. We live in a world where there's wars and rumors of wars, things going on around our world. There's uh, disasters, natural disasters that come and devastate. We have disasters in, in our uh economics, our political system, there's hatred and rage among our nation and around the world. So we're living in a, in a world that doesn't have a lot of hope, doesn't have a lot of joy. Our uh, constitution, or excuse me, not our constitution, our uh, Declaration of Independence has a phrase in it. it, says the pursuit of happiness. You ever think about that? What is that? The pursuit of happiness. Does that mean that this country has, uh, they owe me happiness and they need to make me happy? No, it doesn't say happiness. It doesn't say that we have, we, they have to provide happiness because no one could do that. But it's the pursuit of happiness. It's the pursuit to live a life of, of being able to care for ourselves, care for our families. We live in a nation that has been blessed of God. Amen. And we have this uh, there ahead of us. But I think that this contemporary understanding of the pursuit of happiness is much thinner and much uh, less meaningful. Uh, it's, it's only a shadow of what the Declaration's authors meant. I believe there's so much more to it. But nowadays, it's just like instant gratification. It's like we've lost, we've lost a lot. How do we get that back? How do we get hope? It's only through the Lord. We're trying to achieve lasting happiness. That feel-good feeling, the pleasure, becomes the highest goal. 
I want to live a life with absolutely no pain, no trouble, no suffering. I don't want to have to work. I want to eat whatever I want to eat. I want to live where I want to live. And I don't want anybody to bother me. How many have seen that, that movie, Wall-E? Uh, Disney, or was it? Uh, yeah. Uh, Wall-E, remember Wall-E? And uh, remember the humans on that show? The people? Uh, the people who had been... Uh, they were taken off of Earth because Earth had become a mess. It was an absolute garbage dump, literally. And so the people were taken to this, this ship in space where they could kind of survive until uh, the time came. At least that's what they were told, that the Earth could be made habitable again and they could go back down and, and live there. Well, they lived in this perfect, well... Some people would call it a perfect world, but yet, as you're watching Wally, you realize this isn't, there's a lot of problems here. Remember, they're just sitting on that chair that floats, and they were, like, overweight. They could eat whatever they wanted. They could have whatever they wanted. They, they had screens. They didn't, they didn't even realize there was anybody around them that could just continue screens. And, you know, that kind of, that's almost a, a prediction of how things are now. We're just... Our screens are in front of our faces. We don't realize what's around us anymore. It was happiness, maybe in some sense of the word, but there wasn't any true joy there. There wasn't any true happiness at all. True joy may mean to live our best lives. Now, it's, we don't want to confuse joy with happiness. They're two different things. True joy means that we can live our best lives even in the midst of suffering. We may have trouble. We may have a disaster that strikes. But the joy of the Lord can still dwell within us. We can have that as our strength. Amen. The Jews of Jesus' day were looking for Messiah to come and to deliver them from Roman oppression. That was the immediate need at that point. They were kind of short-sighted. Well, Messiah is going to come. We, we've been looking forward to Messiah for hundreds and hundreds of years. But yet they brought it down to, and he's going to kick Rome out of our country, and he's going to become our king. Well, Rome wasn't even a thought back when Messiah first started being uh, proclaimed, that God said, I'm going to send my servant. See, God's vision was much greater, much greater than these people as they were looking. Yes, he would come, but his goal was to change the hearts of men and women is coming to deal with that thing that no human could deal with, and that's the, the heart. As I mentioned in previous weeks, December can often be, uh, and often is, a very difficult time for so many people. The days are shorter, it's darker, overcast. Joy is not on the radar. But you know what? Even in that, you can experience the joy of the Lord. Amen. So let's take a look at this. We're in Luke chapter 2 today. Luke chapter 2. Very familiar scripture, especially if you have watched Charlie Brown. Linus quotes this very passage. Luke records in chapter 2 the pivot point in history where God's message of salvation broke through, finally broke through. Everything that God had promised, everything he was pointing to, came to be at this point. This is the pivot point. Everything ever since, it all points back to Jesus. Jesus who came and lived his life on this earth. Jesus who came and taught. Jesus who healed. Jesus who died. So let's look at the setup for this joyful news. It was, a, uh, like I said, the Roman world, the Romans were... Uh, in charge of basically the, the known world at that point. Uh, let's read, let's see, verses 1 through 7 here. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. <clears throat> this was the first census that took place while Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee. Galilee. <clears throat> to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he longed to, uh, or excuse me, he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. 
While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room for them. All right, let's look at this. So the emperor makes a decree, Emperor Caesar Augustus. Who is Caesar Augustus? Well, he was the very first emp- uh, the very first Caesar, the very first emperor of the Roman Empire. It was the beginning. He was the one who started it. Previously, Rome had been a republic. It was run by politicians. It was run by laws, and it was enforced by military force. There was all kinds of trouble and wars and issues going on. Julius Caesar was a great general during that time. He was uh, the great uncle of Augustus that we see here today. Uh, He was a military general. Augustus Caesar became the sole ruler of Rome. He became the emperor, the very first emperor, the empire. There was a difference. So the Roman Republic was ruled by, kind of like our nation is, or supposed to be, uh, by politicians and by uh, groups of people. Well, then, empire basically is a dictatorship. Jul- or, excuse me, Caesar Augustus was the number one guy. He was the king, basically. He, he was the one who made all the rules. The buck stopped with him. He was the, the one. And they even uh, saw that he was kind of godlike. They, they, the Caesars of, of the Roman Empire were seen as divine in a sense. Augustus Caesar became the sole ruler. He was known for bringing peace. He was called one of the greatest, probably the greatest Caesar that there was. He brought peace uh, to Rome, to the Roman Empire. It was called Pax Romana. Pax Romana. It was about 200 years of the golden age of peace. The thing about that peace was it was enforced. Uh, pretty strictly. So yeah, there was peace, but you know, that's because, you know, you'd lose your head or something if you didn't go along with the way it was. But he did bring a lot of improvement. There was all kinds of civil wars and trouble and things were falling apart, crops were failing, and he brought a lot of this stuff back to uh, a good place. It's almost like he was Rome's Messiah, sort of. It seemed that all authority, uh, says one uh, commentator, seems that all authority of this man changed the chaos of that time in a very dramatic way. He brought three things that turned the tide miraculously. First of all, he brought peace because he had defeated all of his rivals. Secondly, he brought political and administrative skill, perhaps even brilliance. Thirdly, he brought vast sums of money from Egypt to pay the soldiers, and help the Roman economy. So he did a lot to improve Rome and uh, the Roman Empire. By this time, the Roman Empire basically was so big that it surrounded the Mediterranean Sea all the way around. In fact, as the years went on, at its very height, it stretched out in all directions. We know that the Roman Empire stretched all the way into what's now England and way up into Northern Europe. So it was a very powerful time. And they basically ruled the world of that place at that time. And so censuses were decreed, and a census was decreed here, uh, to see, not just to count how many people we have in our empires, we could say, yay, we have you know, this many billions of people. But it was also a way to say, okay, we need to be, if we have this many people, then we're going to tax them all. We're not going to let anybody escape. Everybody's going to get taxed. So we're going to count them all so that we can tax them. And that was one of the ways that the economy was fed at that point. And then is made mention kind of here in a parenthesis that Cyrenius was the governor of Syria. Well, who's that? Well, basically he was uh, the governor of the area. It says of Syria, but also Judea was part of, uh, was annexed into Syria at that point. So this is the setup. You got a Roman emperor uh, overseeing all of this, and he makes this decree. Okay, everybody's going to get counted, and so at, the way to do this is that everybody needs to go back to their ancestral home. And in all of this, it's, it's, just, it's amazing to see 
now as we look back on it, how God was using this Roman emperor to bring everything to be, to bring it all about. The world responds. According to Luke's account, it was necessary, as I said, uh, for those in the region to return to their ancestral cities to be counted. Joseph's lineage was traced back to King David. So he went from Nazareth to Galilee and Bethlehem in Judah, excuse me, Nazareth in Galilee to Bethlehem and Judah. It was about 80 miles south, uh, trip to the south. And it says he took Mary with him. Mary was his betrothed. Mary was his beloved one, his wife-to-be. And we have to understand the Jewish marriage uh, relationship of the day. It was a two-part process. So the first thing that happened was there was a betrothment. Joseph and Mary had uh, taken care of that part. And this was a very uh, uh, business-like agreement. It was a legal agreement. We're going to be married, and we're going to bring our homes together, and we're going to be together. Then, of course, the second part is the wedding ceremony and the consummation and all of that. So they had only completed this first part, not yet the second part, but yet Mary was pregnant. Well, you know that that caused all kinds of issues and problems back in Nazareth. So at this point, Joseph, he probably didn't have to take Mary with him, but they had this, uh, this legal agreement. Not only that, but it also gave him an opportunity to pull her away from all the stuff, all the controversy that was probably going on in Nazareth. Uh, so he brought her down to this place. And again, Caesar's decree caused all this to be. Ultimately, the decree of Augustus brought about the fulfillment of Micah's prophecy. Micah prophesied over 500 years before that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. And they came to Bethlehem, the city of David, because of Joseph's lineage. And because Caesar made a decree. Sometimes we think, oh, I guess, look at all these, these uh, coincidences that happened. No, it was no coincidence. God knew exactly what he was doing. And as I said, this is a pivot point. God brought it all together. You know, he can do that for you and I. You might think, oh, there's all kinds of coincidences and there's this and that. How does this relate to when we're following the Lord? He brings it all together. When you place your life into his hands, you may not understand why is this happening to me or why didn't this go like that? But we can trust. We can have faith in him. Amen? Joseph and Mary, probably not even aware at that point that God was, was uh, guiding them to this place. And then the birth of the king, verses 4 through 7, where it says, Mary brought forth her very first son. Normally when a baby is born, all the women of the family would come together and help the mother as she gave birth to the child and to clean the child and to care for everything at that point. If you're a mother, then you understand everything that happens at that point. But she was alone. She was alone and far away from home. And so it says that she brought forth and she wrapped him in in swaddling clothes. And she was on her own then. It says she brought forth her firstborn son. Now there's some, another religious tradition that said that Mary was a constant virgin. She was always a virgin. We know that, that, uh, that the, she was the virgin Mary, that, that it was because of the Holy Spirit that she brought forth Jesus. And so they say that, and she continued to be that way, just constant. But it says her firstborn son here, we know that she had other children, right? There was uh, James, the writer of James, and there was Jude, and all these others. Jesus had brothers, half-brothers, but they were brothers. And so it kind of dispels that. I don't know if you've heard that, but it dispels that whole belief. But anyway, and it says there was no room for them in the inn when they were there. And so she gave birth and she laid him in, in a, a feeding trough, basically, for animals, a manger. During this time of census, when they went down to Bethlehem, surely there was probably family members of Joseph down there because this was his ancestral home. But as I said, it was so full. So many people had come to Bethlehem 
that every guest room was full. They didn't have like Motel 6s and stuff like that. They had guest rooms and homes. And every single one was full. And so they had to uh, do what they did. Such humble circumstances for a king. Any king, really, but the king of kings, Messiah. He arrived without fanfare. The king uh, of the region, the governor, Cyrenius, he didn't say, oh, by the way, the king of kings was born in my region today. None of this. He was a humble baby born to a humble couple in very humble circumstances, and that's the nature of Jesus. He came to be what? A servant. So he came to be an example to us. And he, right from the very beginning, his life was that way. And the angels, when they came and proclaimed, they didn't go to the king. They didn't go to the governor. They didn't go to Caesar and say, hey, Jesus has been born. But they went to shepherds. Isn't that interesting? Just regular people. See, the Lord is for the regular people. Not that he's not for famous people, but he's for the regular people. He's humble. He's a servant. God's ways are so different than our ways. Isn't that true? But yet his ways are so perfect. When you look back on how he did what he did. Oh, man, I would have never thought to do it. That. But he did it so perfectly. So let's read that announcement. Verses 8 to 14. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord this will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly with the, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to all those on whom his favor rests. Shepherds. Now, in that day, shepherds were kind of a rough bunch. They were of low moral, moral character. Uh, they were, uh, shepherds in those days were most likely uh, dishonest. And of course, by the nature of their work, they were dirty and smelly. And they were pretty rude. It said that uh, back the custom in those days was they were required to keep their sheep far from, from towns. But because of the circumstances here that they were near a town, chances are th these were not just regular shepherds. These were probably temple shepherds. And the reason that's important is because their job was to keep the lambs for the sacrifices. They were to take care of the lambs. So they, they were in uh, immediate proximity of the temple so that when the time came for sacrifices. See, when people came from a distance, if they were close enough, they would bring their own lamb for sacrifice. Well, you had to park them somewhere, right? So these shepherds took care of them. And then there were also lambs that were there available for people to, to purchase because that was a part of their worship at that time. These lambs, along with already there, uh, were cared for by these special temple shepherds. And so that's likely who the angels were talking to. The shepherds near Bethlehem, taking care of these sacrificial lambs. And all of a sudden, this quiet night, this explosion of glory came out of nowhere. And I love this. Uh, the angel said to them, do not be afraid. Fear not. That always was the case. If you look at angelic uh, things throughout the scriptures, it's, it seems like it's always accompanied with, fear not, don't be afraid. Because they realize, well, this is, this is just too much. Can you imagine? What, you're just out there at night. All of a sudden, kaboom. The glory of the Lord was all around them, the Bible says. 
The angel here is identified as the angel Gabriel. Gabriel was God's chief messenger angel. There's a lot of different angels mentioned in scripture. Angel's job was to care for God's people. Angel's job was to be the mighty heavenly host, the heavenly army that fights for God's people. I mentioned uh, regularly, there's another archangel named Michael. You've probably heard of Michael. He was a warrior angel. Well, Gabriel, as I said, was the messenger angel. He was the one who back, even back in the Old Testament, uh, visited with Daniel and gave him, said, God is answering your prayer. We struggled, we fought. Uh, the forces of the enemy have been fighting against us, but God has answered your prayer. He's heard your voice when Daniel was in uh, Babylon. Uh, and he also, Gabriel is the angel who spoke to Zechariah in the gospels and said, you're going to, your wife is going to have a son in her old age. His name is going to be John. And he's going to be the one who ushers the way for Messiah, John the Baptist, as we know. And Gabriel was the one who came to a young Mary in Nazareth and said, blessed are you among women. You've been chosen to be the one to bear the son of God. As Gabriel appeared to them, the glory of the Lord surrounded them and they were afraid. Now, you've got to admit, that's a very normal emotion to a very abnormal situation. You ever found yourself in a very abnormal situation? And you don't know what to do. These guys have never experienced that before. I was just sitting here, maybe playing my harmonica or whatever's going on here. I don't know. That's not a harmonica. But anyway, <clears throat> for all you band students, anyway. And all of a sudden, kaboom, the glory of God surrounded them. Gabriel said, don't be afraid. Messiah has finally come. Messiah, the one that's been looked for for hundreds of years, has come. He's been born to you in the city of David. And he told them exactly how to find him. You'll find him laying in a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes and cloths. This is the sign to you. He announced the birth of a Savior, which it was and is exactly the need of mankind. Do you realize we don't need another advisor? We don't need a, a, a really good politician. Oh, we do, but for this need, it's not going to be a, another advisor, another reformer, a new law, a, a committee, but it took a Savior to come and to change our hearts. That's what was needed then. That's what's needed now. And then it says Gabriel was joined by the heavenly host. The army of heaven came. And boy, they thought it was amazing to see this one guy, but now the heavenly host, who knows how many angels that was. <coughs> was it all of them? I don't know. I mean, that would be a lot. That would be a lot of angels. But they showed up. One of my favorite accounts, speaking of angels, is in the Old Testament. Remember when Elisha, the prophet, was being chased by the king of Aram, the Ar Aramians, and uh, they wanted to, to get him and, and probably to kill him because he was just causing all kinds of issues for them. And so Elisha and his servant were staying in a, I don't know, a little home, a little, a little cabin. I picture it as a log cabin somewhere out in the wilderness. I don't know. But this little home out in the wilderness and the, and the servant got up and he went outside and looked around and, and he saw the whole Aramean army coming around after them. He's going, oh no, we're in trouble. We're dead. What are we going to do? And Elisha, remember what he did? He said, I don't know. No, he didn't say that at all. He said, uh, well, I... The, the verse is found in, uh, the verses are found in 2 Kings chapter 6. He said this, don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. And then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. It wasn't the cavalry. It was God's heavenly host. It was the armies of heaven surrounding them. Elisha had confidence. He knew that God was watching out for them. 
is just one of the most amazing stories to me. And I think of these shepherds on the hillside and these mighty angels coming and their eyes were open to the glory of God and how amazing that was. This heavenly host came with praise to God, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill to those on whom his favor rests. There was a, uh, even the, said even the pagan people of the day, of, of the time, in the first century, realized that Caesar wasn't the answer to all their issues. Epictetus, I don't know if I'm saying his name right, uh, just call him Epi. Uh, he was a first century pagan writer, and he wrote this down for history to, to record. And he said this, while the emperor may give peace from war on land and sea, he's unable to give peace from passion, grief, and envy. He cannot give peace of heart for which man yearns for, yearns for more than even outward peace. Even he recognized that the emperor wasn't the answer to everything. He didn't realize what God had done. He didn't realize that God had sent his son to come and to do that. But even he realized that there's something wrong. Even in our day, people who don't have any kind of a church background, they, they don't know scripture, they don't trust in the Lord, even they know, you know what? Everything that I've been trying to do to take care of my situation. It's just not doing it. If I'm relying on the government to take care of me, it's just not, it's not enough. It's, there's something deeper. Somebody I was just talking to recently was telling me about somebody that they knew who was just seeking in the way that so many of us do, seeking in different religions, seeking uh, different experiences, something to fill that hole in their heart. But yet that hole in their heart, as we like to say, is a God-shaped hole that only he can fill. People need to know there's, there's fulfillment, there's joy. I'm not talking about happiness, I'm talking about joy, joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. What a night that must have been. At just the right time, God sent his son, Jesus. Romans 5 states, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, somebody might possibly dare to die, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus came as a baby in a manger, at just the right time, just the right time. It wasn't too late, wasn't too early. God sent his son at just the right time to come and to be that Savior, the one to come and die for our sins. We talk about that manger, little manger made out of wood. It's, a, it's probably nothing like that, but that's a manger over there. You can't see it, but it's made out of wood. So he came and he was laid in a little wooden manger, perhaps. And he ended life on a wooden cross. And there's a great story about a tree, giving a tree. Uh, I just, it just came to mind. I wish I would have thought of that. I could have brought it to, to you this morning. But anyway, look that up. Um, so the angels came, spoke to the shepherds, and then they were gone as quickly as they came. Let's read verses 15 to 21. When the angels had left them and gone to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread word concerning what they had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. But Mary treasured up these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they were told. So the angels left. 
the shepherds were probably just kind of looking at each other and going, dude, wow. But they didn't just stay there. They said, let's go. Let's go see what we've been told about. They didn't hesitate at all. They went to see what the angels had told them. They came to the place where Joseph and Mary were there with baby Jesus. From a glorious, blinding announcement to a very quiet, peaceful scene. What a contrast. The very ones tasked to watch over the sacrificial lambs for the temple sacrifice now saw the Lamb of God face to face, laying in a manger. Wow. When they had seen Jesus, just as they hadn't hesitated to go and see the child, they didn't hesitate to go and start telling everybody, hey, man, you won't believe what just happened to us. This is what we saw. This is what we heard. And he's right there. He's in that, that stable over there. And it said the people were amazed. Why were they amazed? Well, the, these guys are just shepherds. What are they talking about? But what they were saying was the word of God. It was the truth of God. The Messiah had come. And it said that Mary treasured all these things in her heart. Mary was probably, uh, probably about 15 or 16 years old at this point. The belief is because that's about the time when uh, young girls were ready to marry. And Joseph was most likely maybe 18, 19 years old. Uh, some people think that he was twice as old as Mary. I don't know. I, I don't think there's any indication of that at all. He was, he was a young man and she was a, a young lady, but yet the maturity and the, the understanding of what was happening, she was very mature in that and said she took these things and pondered them. She treasured them in her heart, all of these things. Remember, she, the angel had come to her and told her, you've been chosen. And then she knew that, uh, you know, that it was all true. She went and talked to her cousin Elizabeth and the baby John the Baptist uh, leapt at the very presence of the, of the Messiah. I mean, all of these things came together. And then, of course, as life goes on, and as she's standing at the very foot of the cross and her son is being crucified, all these things were on her heart and she knew these things. Wow. Just a young lady, young girl, so mature. I love this song we often hear at Christmas. And I think about it from Mary's perspective. Mary, a young teenage girl. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Mary, did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you delivered will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will give sight to a blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will calm the storm? with his hand. Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? And when you kiss your little baby, you kiss the face of God. Mary treasured up these things in her heart. What a beautiful, beautiful picture. What God had done on that blessed night. You know, we think Christmas, yeah, we know the, you know, the manger scene and all that. We see the kids doing the thing and it's so cute and all this kind of thing. It was such a deep, life-changing thing. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. The Lord has come. Amen? This kind of joy enables us to have pleasure, to have hope, to experience the love of God no matter what's happening in our lives. Nobody's life is perfect. We've all got issues. Nothing goes 100% the way we want it to go. Sometimes things just completely fall apart. I was with somebody yesterday. And they were grieving the loss of their young daughter. And you don't, you don't plan for these things. 
But the joy of the Lord can be our strength. The joy of the Lord can be our strength. And the joy of the Lord came and was born and laid in a manger 2,000 years ago. But we need joy or we need strength to make it from day to day. We need that joy that's found only in the Lord Jesus. And again, I encourage us all, let's share that hope. Let's share that joy. Let's, let's bring healing to the world, our world that we minister to. True joy. The angelic message of that night continues, even to this day, to all who would receive it. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this word. Thank you, Lord, for this blessed event that we celebrate year after year. God, we try to remember the meaning of this. We, we say things like Jesus is the reason for the season, but I pray, God, that you would take that message and cause it to hit so deeply in our lives that we can never be the same. We can never look at this, this season the same. Not only that, but that your compassion and your love for other people would rise up within us. That we would bring hope and help and peace to the nation. Lord, we just thank you. Thank you, Lord, for what you did that night. This tiny baby, Lord, impacted the world. God, we love you. We thank you. Pray your blessing upon each and every one, Lord, who is here and who has watched us online. And we ask that Christmas this year would be the most blessed time ever. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for being here. We're always available for prayer, and I know there are some who have prayer needs, so please don't hesitate. We'd love to pray with you. But other than that, go in peace, go in the joy of the Lord. And spread it. Don't keep it to yourself. Merry Christmas to y'all.